Well, thank you all for joining us here today at uh, HMCS Bytown, Ottawa's naval home away from home. I'll make a brief statement and then we'll take questions. I'm obviously pleased with the Crown's decision to stay the charges against me. While I'm relieved to be exonerated of any wrongdoing, I am disappointed it has taken this long. The alarming and protracted bias of perceived guilt across the senior levels of government has been quite damaging, and the emotional and financial impacts of this entire ordeal have taken their toll. I have an important story to tell that Canadians will want and need to hear. It is my intention in the coming days to tell that story, not to lay blame, but to ensure that we all learn from this experience. I would like to express my sincere appreciation for the support of Marie Hennen, Christine Mainville, and my entire legal team, some of whom are with us here today, for their wisdom and guidance. I could not have placed my and my family's life and future in better hands. If I've learned anything from decades in uniform, it is that while professional or personal crisis can be tough, it often brings out the best in people. In that context, I would like to acknowledge the professional and personal risks taken by those who have stepped forward, thereby highlighting their own commitment to the truth. Their actions epitomize what right looks like, and I will forever be in their debt for their personal courage, integrity, and honour. Ultimately, I look forward to my immediate reinstatement and a return to serving Canada, something that I have done unfailingly for the last 38 years, something that Canadians should expect and demand. In closing, I want to speak directly to the thousands of Canadians who stood by me, who supported me and my family, both spiritually and financially. We would simply have never made it here without your generosity and help. Thank you. And just before we begin, I do want to introduce again the all-female team that represented <laughs> Vice Admiral Mark Norman, uh, Sydney Hopkins, at the end, Maya Barroa and my co-counsel, Christine Manville. Um, fortunately, Vice Admiral Norman didn't fire the females that he hired. So we're ready to uh, take questions from you. Yeah. For two years or more, you had the stigma of these criminal charges against you, but the exculpatory information is not known. Why should it be known? How can we find out what it was that set you free? Well, that's uh, in the hands of the prosecution. And as you know, there is another prosecution that is outstanding. Uh, so the Crown has all sorts of obligations in respect of that. Uh, it is sitting with them. As you know, we were in the midst of a third party records application. And so there are uh, literally thousands of documents that we have still not received. The judge was in the course of reviewing them. We've been on month five or six of that exercise. Uh, and as this matter ends today, that means our involvement uh, in the process as well as our ability to compel production uh, ends with it as well. So it is now in the hands of the people who are the holder of those records. En français, Monsieur Norman, oui. est-ce que vous avez l'impression d'avoir été sacrifié dans toute cette affaire-là? Est-ce que vous avez un sentiment d'injustice? Ben, je je n'aime pas le... le le mot « sacrifié », mais je comprends bien que um, c'était un, un processus bien compliqué. Uh, il y avait toutes sortes de considérations et uh, ben, à la fin de la journée, je suis très content avec les résultats aujourd'hui et uh, ben, on va voir ce qui arrive uh, demain et après. 
Ms. Hannon, do you believe that uh, at, you have any evidence that this prosecution initially, or at least the decision to stay it, was politically motivated in any way? Well, there think? are a number of questions there, so let me break it out for a moment. Uh, the decision uh, to stay this prosecution uh, was discretion exercised by the prosecutors and the DPP, uh, unimpacted by any uh, political uh, considerations, as it should be. Uh, that is, in fact, how things are supposed to work. Uh, politics are supposed to stay out of the prosecutorial process. But I would remind you that in this case, the government... Uh, has been at the table, and they've been at the table. They've been represented by seven or eight lawyers in court at the Department of Justice. So these charges were referred by the PCO, the Privy Council Office. Uh, the PCO has been the holder of the records that we've now spent six months uh, trying to get, and to this day, uh, Vice Admiral Norman, uh, because of the position taken by the PMO and PCO's office, has not had access to his own records, and we were continuing in this fight. So they have had a seat at the table. They have been participants in the process. They have been represented. So much so that they are not only the people who decided whether or not to assert cabinet confidence and then a last minute switch to public interest privilege and are not only the holders of the documents but were also counseling witnesses as to what they could and could not say. And I want to make it very clear that we, the defense, had to bring this motion at great expense to Vice Admiral Norman to get at those records. Neither we, and here's the important part, nor the prosecution were given access to those documents. And the people that were standing in the way of that full disclosure is obviously the government who had access to them, had those third party records, and was taking the positions that you all heard they were taking in court. Well, there are many things I think Canadians should be uh, worried about, but it is, uh, I would say, concerning uh, when you want a transparent and open system. So, you, so you presented information to the Crown that they had not seen before? Correct. That is and correct. What, and, and what was their reaction? I mean, this, this investigation went on for two years. Well, that's right. It did go on for two years, and uh, one of the things that we've said in court is that during the course of the investigation, although the information covered a significant part of the Harper government time period, there were no witnesses interviewed from that time period. Uh, you recall that in court we produced uh, the consent of former Prime Minister Harper to release all the documents, uh, despite our repeated requests that that uh, request be made by the PCO. Uh, so, so was that information suppressed? By the RCMP. Uh, no, the RCMP didn't have it uh, and or didn't look for it. I don't think they were suppressing anything. Um, I think the full picture of how these very complicated contracts are in fact negotiated and what the life of this uh, particular uh, contract was was far more complicated, uh, far more sophisticated, uh, and was not com completely looked at. Uh, but as I said at the outset, uh, we brought a third-party records application for a reason. It was to get precisely at those documents that were in the hands of various government bodies, the PCO, the DND, I mean, you name it. None of that came willingly. We have been, and you have all been with us for six months as we have tried day in and day out to try to get that material. It should have been handed over. It should have been handed over to the RCMP. It should have been handed over to the prosecution. It was not. As to the why, I don't know. I leave you to answer. Will you file an abuse of process Sorry, or abuse of We're, we're going to give everyone a chance to answer a question. Yeah, Christy. So, this result today, this happy result for you, is despite the government. That's what you're saying. Uh, exactly right. When you ask the question about uh, political um, participation in the state, it is despite, not because of. Lee? I wanted to ask also about the, the civil suit, if, if you are planning to file a civil suit as well as. Uh, you've talked about uh, you, you talked about the leadership in, in the government and military. You want to return to service. Do you have confidence in the leadership in the military and the government, and what needs to change? Well, let me just address the civil suit issue. We, we've just walked out of court after two years of a uh, heck of a fight. Uh, so we're not thinking about anything at all. But 12:30 <laughs> at the end of this press conference, uh, it'll be another day and another time when we consider that. And uh, look, I'm ready to go back to work. Uh, I, I've been saying this all along. Uh, I. It, other people will have to have conversations and decide what that looks like. I can't tell you right now what that's going to look like. 
what I can say is that national institutions are bigger than any one person, and they have to be, and they should be. And so we will watch that space and see where this goes in, in the days ahead. Can you, can you? Yes. Sorry. Sorry. I was just going to ask what needs to change. I mean, you've talked about that leadership within the public service. What, what do you think needs to change to ensure that, you know, this doesn't happen again, uh, that you're... I spoke about a bias. I didn't speak directly about the leadership. My comments were directed at a systemic bias that developed over the early days of this investigation and then subsequently through the last two years, as Ms. Hennon has described. That's what I was referring to. Um, how, how that bias occurred, why, who was involved, um, th those are all conversations for, for another day. But that's that's what I was referring to, Lee. Okay. Tom, yeah. Yes. Um, so the Crown made a big deal of saying that they couldn't prove uh, the idea that your whatever your behavior was, they called it still inappropriate but not criminal, uh, didn't show a marked departure from other the standards expected. So did the documents that you produced show other leaks by other senior government officials or General Vance or other military leaders to anybody of what you would consider confidential government information? I, I, as I said to you, I am not going to get into the specifics of the documents that were provided, but let me answer your question a little more generally, that when you're looking at the standard, uh, a marked and uh, substantial departure from the standard, basically you're looking at how business was being done, how was this particular contract, let's say, being negotiated, what was the range of information and communication that was flowing from the government uh, to the contractor. And having looked at all of that, of how this contract actually was negotiated, and all the information that was flowing back and forth, it gave them the context of how this particular uh, thing was negotiated. That's the standard. That's what you're looking at. How was business being done? How were people behaving? Uh, in terms of uh, leaks from other people, I, I'm not going to to get into that. And it's, sorry, I, 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 we're gonna we're just gonna just give wanna, everybody. A, I want to finish with uh, the previous question and uh, just to pick up on this this issue of um, uh, and and Ms. Hennon said it, it, it. It's the context, and many of you cover defense procurement. Uh, it is a very complicated, obtuse, and ultimately ugly process. And uh, what goes on inside uh, that process is difficult to explain at the best of times. And so um, I am confident that uh, at all times I acted with integrity, I acted ethically, and I acted in the best interest of the Royal Canadian Navy, the Canadian Forces, and ultimately the people of Canada. Yes, go ahead. But sorry, just, sorry. Just, We're gonna... she want, they want me to repeat the same thing in French. Ce que j'ai dit à votre collègue, c'est que um, le système de procurement de la défense uh, est très compliqué. Uh, c'est pas simple et uh, c'est aussi un, un dégoûtant d'une façon. Et uh, quand je pense à ce qui est passé uh, dans cette situation spécifiquement, uh, J'ai confiance que tout ce que j'ai fait, c'était dans les intérêts de la Marine royale Canada, les forces armées du Canada, puis les Canadiens et Canadiennes. Merci. Throughout this case, and you mentioned it here today, um, a number of individuals weighing in as it's gone through the courts, and even before that, it got to the courts as well. Do you want an apology from anyone in particular in government in this? And most notably, do you want an apology from Prime Minister Justin Trudeau for how he has commented on the case? He's commented a number of times on this case, as you know, before it ever went into court. And as we now know, um, after our application uh, for third party records was filed uh, there were numerous comments made uh, from the pco anonymous sources and the treasury board anonymous sources responding to our application that was proceeding in a court a, a bit of an extraordinary event i've certainly never uh, seen that uh, uh, occur uh, so there to say there was a, an interest in this case uh, puts it mildly um, vice admiral norman has been through a great deal his family has been through a great deal. Uh, there is a ship, a supply ship, that is operational on time and under budget, thanks in part to Vice Admiral Norman. Uh, I think it's time to say sorry to him. Yeah, let's just sorry. I'd like to follow up on Amanda's question. 
Um, it, there are lots of questions that need to be asked and answered about this whole process the last couple of years. Um, and I think some people who have been involved in this need to reflect on what happened and why it happened and their, their role in that. Now, ultimately, they'll make whatever decision they, they want or need to make. And uh, I, I would like to think that people are going to do the right thing. Thank you. You yep. referenced another legal proceeding related to this, which is the case of Matthew Matchett. What do you make of the fact that Matchett was only charged after you brought it out in your own court application? Well, the timeline was that on October 12th, uh, 2018, we filed our notice of application for third-party records. In it, we did discuss the fact that uh, Mr. Matchett was both uncharged and seemed to be not, uh, uh, not suspended, still working. And on October 17, 2018, it became uh, publicly uh, known that he was then suspended. So I don't know. I just can give you the timeline. I don't you know what that, to make of it. You said that Canadians should be worried about many things. Can you expand on that? You said that Canadians should be worried about many things. Could you expand on that? Yeah, I, I think they should be concerned when there are attempts to bring the political into a criminal courtroom. And I think they should feel very proud and very happy today uh, because what they saw is that our justice system is truly unassailable. The prosecutors in a high profile case looked at the evidence and did what they're supposed to do. They said, we don't have a reasonable prospect of conviction. The DPP acted independently. If it tells you anything, it tells you that when she thinks you should prosecute, she goes ahead, and when she thinks you shouldn't, she declines to do so. That's the way it should be. No person in this country should ever walk into a courtroom and feel like they are fighting their elected government or any sort of political factors at all. So this was uh, a good day because you saw actually, and I'm glad you did, uh, the prosecutors and the judge all acting independently and all that other stuff stays outside when you, once you shut the courtroom doors. You should be very concerned when anyone tries to erode the resilience of the justice system or demonstrates a failure to understand why it is so fundamental to the democratic values that we hold so dear. There are times you agree with what happens in a court, there are times you don't, and that's fine. But what you don't do is you don't put your finger and try to weigh in on the scales of justice. That is not what uh, should be happening. And so uh, I think we have lots of lessons to learn from this and other cases. And I know Canadians are paying close attention. And I'd like to, re I'd like to, oh, just, I'd like to repeat my comments from inside the courtroom where I uh, genuinely acknowledged the efforts of all of the participants in that legal process. And the, the, the effort that they put into this to maintain the integrity of the system that Ms. Hennon has just described is, is remarkable and it's noteworthy and they should be commended for that. I have and continue to have, notwithstanding my extensive experience inside the, the machinery of this process, I have the utmost confidence in our judicial process and, and, and I stand by that, notwithstanding what's happened to me and my family. Vice Admiral, I wonder if you can talk about a bit, a bit more about what the most difficult part about this whole process, what that was, as well as um, if you really think it's realistic that you could, you know, resume your old role, or just given the, you know the clash that you've had with what would be your employer. Let me answer the second question first. Uh, I've been doing this now for 38 years. Uh, I've worked for a lot of people. I've been asked to do a lot of things. Uh, I'm ready to go. And as I said earlier in response to another comment, this, the national institution that is your armed forces is much bigger than any one person. So that's where my loyalties are. I'm going to serve the people of Canada. And, and the rest of it, as far as I'm concerned, is a distraction. To the first part of your question, you're going to have to remind me because I reacted to the second part. <laughs> <laughs> um, What's uh, of this entire process? What oh, was well, the most difficult part? Right, that's why I, I was ignoring it. <laughs> um, I, 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 Two perhaps strange um, bookends to that question. Um, one of the hardest parts on an emotional level, although it was inspiring, was to receive letters and donations from World War II veterans uh, giving me $5 to help my legal fees. Um, just a sec. 
Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, the hardest part is uh, watching my family I have to live with this on a day to day basis. So, there you go. Thanks. What do you think it's going to be like walking back into your family the first time? Well, um, if I get my building pass sorted out, <laughs> um, I, uh, I don't know. It, it'll, I, I don't know. I think it'll be surreal in some respects. Uh, it'll be like I never left in others. Um, I know lots of the people there, many of them. Um, there's great business going on there. There's lots of important work to get done. Um, I, I would like to think it would be actually pretty seamless. That would be my view. Do I miss it? I miss the people. I miss the camaraderie. I don't miss some of the things that I was describing earlier that perhaps contributed to me sitting here with Miss Hennon, but I'm glad I am sitting here, notwithstanding <laughs> the fact. Okay? Yes. Well, the defense minister said the government will be covering your legal fees. Can you oh. respond to that? <laughs> oh, it's a response. <laughs> um, yeah. that, that's wow. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Yeah. Um, right up until you reached there, they reached out and settled this issue with you and agreed that there's no chance of conviction. The government in its various forms and arms was still dragging its feet, still not producing documents, still blah, blah, blah. Um, did you get the sense that the government, as opposed to the PPSC, was going to try and adjourn the trial dates in uh, August? Well, I think I made it very clear throughout this proceeding that uh, there was no way we were agreeing to an adjournment of this case. It was going to proceed in August. And I think the trial judge made it very clear that we were going to proceed in August and she was going to do whatever was necessary to ensure that the matter was trial ready. We have never wavered from that position. Uh, and you are correct. It took months and months and months, six months, to get documents. And as we sit here today and as we walked out of that courtroom, we still did not have all of them. And as you heard Her Honor say, as recently as yesterday, she had received another tranche of documents. Um, there were numerous lawyers in court. There are thousands of people that work for government. There are four lawyers sitting here, and we reviewed every single thing. So I do not know why it moved at the pace that it did. I raised those concerns repeatedly in court, uh, and I indicated unequivocally that no pace was going to take me off course from getting this matter to trial in August. Okay. Yes. And who you then, I mean, in all of this, you said that the RCMP didn't get those documents. They should have right. been provided to the RCMP or right. to the prosecution. Then where does the blame lie for what you're describing here? Uh, I, I'm not here to, to put uh, blame on anybody. I can only tell you what the facts are. But if we're to learn from it, what are we to learn? Well, the, fa science? the facts are that uh, we were required to bring an application in court that's dragged on six months to get documents. The documents we sought, which are set out in the record, were from the Prime Minister's office, from the Privy Council office, from the DND, from numerous arms of government, Treasury Board as well. So one way one could facilitate that proceeding is you would instruct your lawyers to come to court and say, we're not objecting to any of it, here it all is. Another way to deal with it is to litigate it for six months. So it was litigated for six months, is and it continued. Decision, I wasn't making the decisions. What was What's your motivation? Why did they act that way? I don't know. You're asking the wrong person. But what's your interpretation of it? Because you're, you know, talking about their attitude, the way they handle things. Why do you think they were slow and? I don't know. I guess you'd have to look at the comments that were repeatedly made in the House of Commons and. Uh, uh, the approach and the last minute switch, for example, from repeatedly for months asserting cabinet confidence despite us asking that it be waived. From the moment that Vice Admiral Norman was charged, we asked that they waive cabinet confidence so we could defend him. And the answer was unequivocally no. Two, two weeks after a notice of application being filed, an about face. So I don't know what uh, was going on. I can only, like you, look at the timeline. I don't have any more of a window into it than you, but I think the timeline is something to 
uh, to look at, the explanation for the change, the refusal to reach out to former Prime Minister Harper when the entire information, the bulk of it, was covered under that time period and could have facilitated the production of documents. Uh, I don't know. All of this was articulated in court. I can't tell you why those decisions were made and at the same time assertions were made that people were concerned about Vice Admiral Norman getting a fair trial. What's the timeline between when you gave this information to the prosecution and they make the decision to uh, uh, not proceed? As Ms. Garcia indicated, it was towards the end of March um, that they received uh, the documents and we met with them and then they conduct as they do any time that you provide information to the prosecution, you expect it to be tested and they conduct a review of it and they do other interviews. Uh, and so that was the time. It, it's been over that, a month. You, are you pleased with the pace and that seriousness that they Well, they, that? they moved very quickly. I mean, they moved in a very responsive manner when they received the information. And it's not the first time, as you know, that I've provided information to the prosecution and asked them to objectively review it, which should tell you, give you a good clue as to what my faith is uh, generally in the, in the prosecution. The Crown says you put conditions, certain conditions on the documents you gave them in March uh, outside court today. She told us that the defense provided us documents under certain con conditions for our purposes only. What was that and why? Well, we wouldn't normally disseminate in advance of a trial all our defense material. Uh, so when we provide it to the prosecution, it is for their review and their assessment because you don't know how their assessment is going to go. Uh, that's pretty common that you would provide it to them because you may be facing a trial at some point and you don't want that uh, to be uh, disclosed everywhere. So that's a, a fairly typical thing that you would give it to them and you'd say, review it, uh, but obviously if you don't come to the same conclusion, then that's it. It's they game over. Release them today? It's, it's uh, their decision to, should to, to do. It's their decision to decide. They have other considerations besides our case. Can you explain? Hang on a second. Yeah. As a result of the, the disclosure that happened, you're, you now have thousands of pages of sensitive government documents. What conditions are the, what happens with those documents now? Do, are you, do they have to stay confidential or are you able to use them in the future? not be allowed to disseminate them. There's actually law on what you can do in terms of material that you receive in the context of a criminal case and, and whether it can be used in any other context. Uh, so uh, we will not be releasing them on WikiLeaks. Have you talked to General Banks since, since this decision this morning and are, is there any concern about possible administrative action? Uh, General Vance and I have been in regular communication throughout this process as in fact I believe you reported on. Um, I expect the the intensity of those communications to increase over the next couple of days, um, and uh, the, uh, I'm not going to comment on administrative action or however people want to deal with this. Or don't. I have not spoken to General Vance today. Sorry, back there. Il y a trois ans, j'ai été choisi pour le poste de vice-chef d'état-major de la Défense. Euh, quand la décision a été prise de, de me suspendre, j'étais dans le poste. Euh, je crois que pour moi et pour les forces armées canadiennes, le meilleur choix, c'est pour moi de retourner dans mon propre poste. Merci. One last question. So just yeah. Clarity, the Crown didn't have this information, but the government was in possession of this information, and it relates to the time that Prime Minister Harper was in in office. So, who was holding back that information, and why? I hope you find an answer to both of those questions. I did what I could in a courtroom, and it took me six months. Uh, and in addition to that, a lot of that information. Uh, in fact, the bulk of it was a result of extensive interviews that we conducted and an extensive investigation that we did from the moment that the warrants were executed. Uh, we have been at this for many, many, many months, uh, and we have done uh, an investigation ourselves. And we were fortunately able to track a great deal of information down. Uh, you saw in court on a few occasions uh, members uh, that had either peripheral involvement or more central involvement coming forward and saying, look, there's this information you should be aware of, and we're, uh, we're fortunate that they did that. But I, I don't know why it was not produced before, uh, and, uh, you know, I leave it to you to get those answers. Marie, is there any to be made of the fact that 